Hello, drums and other creatures. We're having another chatty video today, and I'm here with Joao Figueiredo, which I just realized I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but there you go. And Joao is a well-known educator in the UK. He's got a couple of music schools in Leeds up north, in this, the, the mysterious up north place that I've heard about. And uh, he's very interested in educational psychology. He's studied the topic and likes to bring that and mix it in with his drum teaching. Uh, Joao's studied with a lot of very well-known educators. And, and I wanted to talk to him today because the, the topic of education in particular is of interest to me. And I, I really like exploring uh, people with different approaches who are really thinking about teaching as a topic uh, and not just maybe, I think it's fair to say, Joao, that you're not someone who's just going to follow the herd and you, you've given a lot of thought to the way you have approached teaching so uh yeah say hello and uh, let us know a bit about yourself sure well first of all thank you for having me it's uh, it's always great to talk about things that i'm passionate about i usually do that anyway during my private lessons and i end up going off on massive rants about all things education because i live and breed the these ideas uh, okay so i'll give you the the less known story because you can find stuff on my website and yes i did found music lab but i'll go back if, if it's okay to the origin story because I think that explains a lot uh, as to <laughs> how I uh, I think and why I think the way I do. So I was born in Portugal um, 37 years ago, and um, I I come from a family of educators. The, the 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 twist is that they were all very academic people, like my grandparents, uh, both in the hard sciences of biology and geology. My mom. Uh, likewise, a biologist, my dad, less, um, I, I guess he kind of uh, um, walks the line between art and science because he, he studied architecture, mm -hmm. um, but all of them then dedicated themselves to teaching these fields. None of, of uh, and, and there's more relatives that yeah, you know, I could go on and on, uh, on and on about how so, such a large portion of my family are people dedicated to teaching, sharing knowledge. They would study these, uh, you know, very highbrow fields and then go on to teach them at very low pay. Uh, so it's <laughs> it's obviously like a passion-driven uh, lifestyle. So I was brought up in this sort of environment. The, you know, lunch and dinner was mom and dad talking about teaching and what they did at school and the challenges they had. And I was constantly taking all this in, uh, both subconsciously uh, and then later on more consciously. I would ask questions. I would, uh, you know, I could feel myself getting curious about particular conversations, especially, and this is where my then not following the herd trait comes from, how frustrated they were with the system. Everything was red tape, everything was obstacle. It seemed like it was designed to make their lives difficult and therefore the students. Um, my mom uh, eventually actually decided to retire early because she just couldn't be bothered. <laughs> she took a pay cut just to not deal with the system anymore. Yeah. Um, which is unfortunate the way we, we treat Teachers in the UK is not a lot uh, <laughs> that much different. Uh, if you look no. at the statistics of, um, you know, within the first five years of a teacher joining the public sector, uh, how many retire or retire teaching? Obviously, they go on to pursue other careers because they'll be in their thirties. But it's staggering. The numbers are just insane, and 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 no one's really doing much about a, a field that has a, a turnaround that you know if this were, were a private company this company is failing yeah like if you have a company that within the first five years of hiring staff 82 percent quit and not only quit your company but they quit the field within your company within which your company operates this is <laughs> you're saying like there's something traumatic <laughs> about teaching like yeah. they go in all wide-eyed, and then five years later, nope, I'm done with this, I'd rather do sales. So as a kid, you'd been sort of exposed to, I guess, conversations about, uh, I don't know, things in the system that aren't working brilliantly, and which is a bit unusual, I suppose. 
not not everybody is exposed to that. So you, does that mean you sort of approach the things that you were doing with some skepticism? All the skepticism. I mean, I was pretty adamant on I am not teaching at any public school ever. Yeah. And I've been I've stayed true to I've that it. ever since. <laughs> I just, I won't do it. Um, I just don't feel comfortable. And yes, there is an element of conditioning, <laughs> I'm sure, from all those stories that I that I heard. But the sad truth is that these were not two jaded people bickering about their bosses. These were two people who are, are still extremely passionate about teaching. And, and, and I could see the progression. It wasn't always like that. Over the years, uh, uh, you know, our, our societies have morphed into more and more this neoliberal sort of format of, mm -hmm. you know, create the next generation of workers. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, I, I sort of suspect it's sort of been the intention of the the sort of national school systems. A hundred percent. Founded. Um, and so you learned that were your family musicians as well or is the teaching the thing that that rubbed off on you not at all yeah no one really plays anything my granddad sort of half played the mandolin okay. but not really it was oh, you need, really you need a hobby yeah yeah now. yeah and so but it was really a hobby thing so no i was not brought up in an artistic environment at all like i said earlier my dad would be the only person really in my close family kind of walked that line because he studied architecture um but he was fairly artistic still is he's still alive and well he paints he sculpts but his main uh, profession was in within the architecture field which again it's kind of like a scientific -y approach to art right let's make sure yeah. this house doesn't fall before anything else but you want it to look nice as well so exactly yeah eye. and so uh how did you start drumming like what, what sort of age and what was it that drew you to that yeah the backstory is it's it's actually not very it's a bit of a cliche it's it's one of those things you get to a certain age i was four or five years old parents ask you what would you like to do for your activities i probably knew someone who played music i said music um as a parent myself now that's kind of those decisions now i i'm on the other side of it i ask that question uh, and my son tells me things that are clearly quite um, arbitrary. <laughs> like yeah. it's something that he thought of that day. Yeah. But that's great because then you just expose them to to those activities, and that's what happened to me. Joined the local music school. Um, drum teacher was not too keen on teaching someone so young. I'm still not very tall. I was very short then, so I couldn't reach the pedals. Wow. <laughs> and he kind of tried to deter me by. Um, I think my personality showed that day because he tried to go like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll teach you, but it's just going to be snare drum stuff because you can't play the kit. No. And I said, okay. I think he wanted me to say no. <laughs> but uh, I mean, A lot of kids, they, they, they are put off by the snare drum stuff, aren't they? Oh, I loved it. I was like, okay, that sounds fine. <laughs> Um, and then I, I really fell in love with, with the whole rudimental stuff and technique, and I'm still very nerdy about that stuff in the most positive way. But um, that was really the, 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 the upbringing there was trying the local music school. Then I just played a bunch of other instruments or, or attempted to learn them. Still at the same school, I would kind of like every two years or so, I kind of do a little bit of a search about like what about bass what about piano so i ended up learning the piano decently kept going back to the drums though so as but you do nothing better really yeah. of course i tried to do some piano and i just can't take the other instruments seriously enough i, I completely agree with that statement <laughs> uh and um and yeah but that's really what happened and at 15 and i i've i have told this story to my students so many times like my career is just a bunch of accidents. At 15, I was playing with, with friends. Like now I'm starting to join bands and stuff like that. And one day we were playing uh, at what was a jam session, sort of like open stage night uh, at a local bar. And we're just messing about, literally, because there's no stakes. You're just improvising, just being silly. And the owner... Playing. Playing, exactly. Playing with, with our little toys. And... Um, 
and the owner comes to us at the end. This is like one o'clock in the morning. He might have been a bit drunk, but he goes, you guys are really good. Um, why don't we give you guys like a, a one night a week thing? And it was a Tuesday night, to be completely honest. There was not like it was not a, a, a marquee sort of spot, but uh, <laughs> Tuesday night became our residency night. So we were not like the local young kids who all, because we all met at the music school, so we knew music. He was very impressed by that. Uh, he was clearly very passionate about music, but knew nothing about it. And so we started to do the, those um, Tuesdays. And the first time we showed up to do the gig, we had some songs prepped and all that. And at the end of the night, once again, he walks up to us and gives us money. Mm -hmm. And nice. I was like, ooh, I like this. Yeah. If we do this more times a week, <laughs> we'll make more money. And that was the beginning of my career. I, I was He hadn't told us beforehand that he was going to pay us. He hadn't told us, I mean, let alone how much he would have been. And he was very low paid, just to, to make that also very clear. Uh, it was, but yeah, it's nice. It feels something when, when someone does pay you and appreciates you in that way. It, it takes you to another level of recognition of what, what the, the doing of music is about. And you go from play into work in some sort of way. But yeah, at that sort of age, I can imagine that has a positive influence. Oh, it was amazing. I felt so rich. I had 25 euros in my pocket that I didn't have before I started that, that gig. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> uh, and that, that dopamine hit was very addictive. And um, so I was like, I, of course, again, I was 15. I gradually turned myself into a professional musician. And then by age 19, I... Uh, it, it was again a, a very strange accident. I'm just outside a um, new music, uh, sorry, music shop, not a music school, um, that had just opened in my hometown, which is a very small town outside of Lisbon. So there's not a, a lot of action, let alone competition for music schools. That was the only one. So I'm just hanging out with a friend of mine who worked there. And then suddenly one of the owners sticks his head out of the door. We were outside and he goes, you play drums, yeah? And I go, yeah. And he, can you read music? Yes. Do you want to teach drums? And that was my job interview. Okay. H had you thought about teaching before that point? Not really. So it's like, it wasn't like you'd, you'd sort of taken the, the family profession and thought, I'm going to apply this to my music. Uh, it just sort of happened. I think not yet. Yeah, not yet. I mean, I, again, I was 19. Yeah, um, I had been studying the drums for a long time. And uh, to be honest with you, and this is something that might relate to a lot of people listening. I thought this is this is what it is being completely honest. I thought the job was you gig. Mm -hmm. Never like even occurred to me that you could just dedicate your life to teaching. Like I, it just yeah. felt like that's what people did when they were free. Yeah, I think it's sort of like until you're like at least 30 or something like that, it's not something you want to think about particularly. I mean, I felt like it was definitely, oh, well, I don't know that playing is going to be my thing uh, as a as work. And sort of teaching was like, oh, I suppose I better try teaching. And it, that, that happened to me as well by accident. People just said, oh, teach me the drums. And yeah. Like, oh, all right. Fair enough. And it's sort of fun when it's not something you're trying to do for money. It's fun even. I mean, I love teaching, but... um. It's, yeah, when it just happens, I think a lot of people, they just happen into teaching. Show me some drumming. Yeah, 100%. And in my case, that was the job interview. But but then as soon as I said yes, I, I had that moment that we often do in life as we get older where I saw my future. Yeah. Okay. I was like, ooh, I can do this. Because I, I actually you. realized in that moment, yeah, it triggered this awareness that I think I know a lot about teaching actually. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's interesting. I, I knew I was inexperienced in the actual doing it, um, but I there was something in me that gave me that confidence to be like, I think I can just show up and, and observe. Yeah. Um, and and that's kind of what happened. They gave me one student uh, who was a, a four year old girl. Actually, I posted recently on my Facebook like a couple of weeks ago. I had like this memory of my beginnings for, for whatever reason and i realized that she's now 22. oh wow she's like, oh wow i'm getting i have no idea 
completely lost touch. I always ask people, you know, are you still drumming? Yeah. yeah. Well, I haven't spoken to her in, in you know, some yeah. 16 years or whatever. Um, 17 years that, that was. Um, and uh, yeah, I have no clue. I mean, I wouldn't even be able to recognize her, which is in a way funny and also a little scary because <clears throat> the passage of time is a little like, whoa, what's going on here? But it, It's funny, especially when I think when you have your own kids, they sort of progress in this very gradual way. Um, but when, when you know a child who then you don't see for a while and then they rematerialize, it's quite shocking. I know, I when know. You see them growing I mean, up. But, well, I suppose even with friends and stuff, they all, you know, all my friends. Absolutely. Like, right? I've, I've, I've started to have that, uh, those uh, encounters where I see, especially when I visit Portugal now, because obviously now I've left Portugal for almost a decade ago. So I, I go back there just on holiday, seeing family. And I see a student, again, I come from a small place. <laughs> It's not hard to see familiar faces mm -hmm. and I see someone and I'm always a bit like, I'm going to look like the weirdo waving and they have no idea who I am because <clears throat> they've I mean, completely forgotten. Like, who's this guy waving at me? So I don't. Yeah, you've got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, so what happened then from the age of 19, uh, you've, you've been around the world a little bit. You've been here and there. I think you, did you pursue the playing career and the teaching career in parallel? I did. Yeah, I did up until I was 30, really. Uh, in fact, uh, up until I moved to the UK, I, I, when I moved here, my first two missions were, okay, I got to find myself five, six students, let's go, and I got to find myself a band. Yep. Uh, and that happened within the first, like, three, four months. Uh, and that band, we ended up um, touring quite a bit within the UK. And the decision to stop gigging actually came because of that band and not because they were great guys, but because they were actually picking up some steam, I started to cancel lots of lessons and I was very annoyed at myself, right? I was like, this is really frustrating me. I'm not like emotionally, this trade-off is not serving me. Mm -hmm. Like being in the car, driving to the gig, loading, unloading. But I was like, yeah, I mean, the, those 60 to 80 minutes on stage are fun. Everything surrounding it is super annoying. Yeah, very. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. And it's interesting. Um, I always find that uh, students or parents of students like to hear that a teacher is actively gigging. And whenever you look at someone's uh, website, they're always advertising how busy they are as a musician. But I have quite a few students who come to me because their teacher is always on a gig, and yeah. they don't have the the time necessarily to have the the dedicated. Uh, schedule that helps most students when they want to sort of make regular progress and so it, yeah it's a funny thing isn't it there, there's that sense that people like the idea that you're an active uh, performing musician but actually I think the teaching is uh has different requirements and different obligations uh, yeah. so yeah I'm, I'm in the same camp as you I, I I don't really play live very much uh not not in a serious way I do some recording here and there but yeah, I, I love the teaching and it, it's a thing that, that takes a sort of focus and dedication that, that you, you can do that as your main uh, level of interest. So that's good. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just say, I, I say it very proudly to parents and even students who ask me, I say very proudly, nope, I only teach. And mm -hmm. I, I think I say it with such intention that they understand that I, that's not, this was a choice. Yep. And, uh, and, you know, that means that when I'm here with you, I'm thinking about this. Yeah, you're dedicated to their path and their development. And that's it. I got no other distractions besides, you know, normal human distractions such as, you know, YouTube. And <laughs> yeah. So how TV. did you come to sort of open a music school? I, I've been an independent teacher for a while and, and taught in various scenarios. At the moment, I'm fortunate enough to do it sort of from my home studio. Um, but you've gone to so, sort of uh, the next level, I guess, and, you know, develop some premises. Your music yeah. school uh, is is music lab, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, you teach, I don't know, tell me what you teach. All, all the instruments are being taught at your school. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have, currently we have two schools. We have about 215, this is a, a, a roundabout number, but 215 students a week. Uh, 12 teachers, 13 teachers. Wow. Yeah. Um, sorry if I'm and forgetting about the 14. Is it pop-based stuff? Is it um, piano, guitar, drums, obviously? Yes. 
yeah, singing. We we also offer violin. And we also offer saxophone. It really depends on. Fantastic. We'll keep adding stuff as people ask for them, right? It's it's a little bit of just how it works. I don't have a set uh, list of instruments we offer. If yeah. uh, suddenly twenty people ask for triangle lessons, hey, let's make it happen. Why not? Uh, yeah, absolutely, it's a, it's a deep subject. So, <laughs> um, so what are the kind of things that have informed? I mean, like one of the things. Uh, I feel like watching the online sort of educational space evolve and develop, and I've developed with that. So I was a, a teacher uh, sort of developing my teaching skills, and I had my teachers who sort of supported and mentored me. I've also watched a lot of YouTube videos and, you know, studied all that material that's around. And um, yeah, so a part of my interest is like, what are some of the, the myths of, I guess teaching where everybody says you must do this and like what are some of the approaches that you have to teaching that might be a little bit different uh, that like, okay one of the things i find is that uh especially when like well with the adults there's this expectation that, that a teacher is someone who's <laughs> going to tell you why you're wrong yeah. what you're doing is bad which couldn't be further from the, the experience that I've had. I mean, I, I know that you also still study under other teachers. I study and uh, I've, I've never had a teaching scenario where someone's just like telling me I'm wrong about something. Um, and so there's one sort of misconception as if they've carried this idea from school where mm. the, the teacher tells you, oh, your geography homework is wrong and you're mm -hmm. bad. And so I'm giving you a bad mark or whatever it is. And so adult students definitely are still carrying that kind of thing. And I, I notice as well, the children are sort of quite similar, even though they don't express it so explicitly. So um, yeah, maybe maybe give us an idea of sort of what your approach is and whether you can uh, speak about how, how you sort of support your students and whether or not, you know, maybe we can help to share this idea that a teacher isn't someone who's, whose job it is to tell you you're wrong, basically. I, I mean... He does. He does. I mean, and immediately so many things came to my mind. I, I could. I had flashbacks of lessons with adults who showed me that 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 <laughs> trauma uh, because that's what it is. Um, yeah, I Very might. Common. I might go. Yes, it really is. I might go just uh, as a preemptive warning, a little long-winded because this is what I do. But interrupt me it. at any point, like, just go, I've got a question, I've got it. Oh, I can do that as well. Awesome. Because uh, it, it, this is really like my main focus. And now that, just to tie it back to Music Lab, now that we have several teachers on board, they all go through this level of training where they don't, um, in a way, b bring into their teaching potentially things that they've experienced as students, both from their music teachers, which is possible, but also, like you said, like in the mainstream education system, because that's where a lot of the damage comes from. So I don't know if your viewers saw it, but I was nodding very aggressively when you said that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I was like, yes, it's it's there's so much. Um, yeah, there's so many problems in, in the educational system, but from my personal approach, so I suppose I have a few underpinning philosophies be behind the, the way I approach teaching. One of them would be something that's very well known nowadays, fortunately, because it's a good thing in my opinion, which is growth mindset. So I, mm -hmm. I score uh, progress over achievements and accolades. In fact, if you go on Music Lab's website, the tagline right at the top, it says something like people before music, yeah. progress before accolades. Yeah, fantastic. I'm to make it very clear. A, a, a not a good drug, in my view. No, no, because it, it's uh, it's a never ending. Um, it's it's a it's a run to, it's a race to the bottom because you're constantly like, oh, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's... Progress, though, it's it's an ongo. It's a verb, right? Not not a noun or, or an adjective. And I, I that's how I assess myself. I'm always pushing myself. That's pretty clear in my own career, but. The fun I have doing it, it tells me something. Because yeah. for me, it's like, this is just, it's a game. And every day I pull myself forward. Like, I try to like, what else can I do here? What, what can I improve on? Sometimes it's a little deeper. Sometimes it's a little more uh, superficial. Like what other classes can I launch? Yeah. 
right? It's not the the, the deepest of the <laughs> the missions, but um, but it's it's part of of the game that I'm playing. So I remind my students of this, right? Drumming is just another game, right? And um, as soon as you learn the rules, you learn two things. You learn that when you break them, yes, you won't sound as great, but you will also learn to walk that line between rule following and creativity, yep. right? The, the, Which is uh, you, very, very important. Extremely. And it I find... forgotten by a lot of, you know, teachers, teachers and, yeah. 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 and students. Yeah. I mean that it's a, it's a it's a passing on problem, right? We keep passing these these ideas on to the next generation. They'll be like, "If you say so, sir." Yeah, um, uh, uh, <laughs> it's true. So how do you how do you sort of approach? Have you developed a sort of systematic approach to teaching, or or do you, are you sort of working in an intuitive way with people? Do you have like a strong sense of of what a good pathway of learning the drums? You said you started with. Uh, learning the snare drum yourself, um, you know, do you try and sort of figure out what makes each student tick and and sort of flow with that, or well, what's your, I'll, what's your process I'll, I'll, like? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say something highly controversial. The best system is no system at all, uh, because you're just Not setting yourself up for me. disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you know what I mean, right? A lot of people would be like, "Oh my goodness, how how dare you not immediately teach all grades and." making sure that they got all their books. And I'm like, I kind of just like to look at them and observe, you know, if, I, if I'm to use a proper label and I'm, I'm okay with it. I mean, I don't have necessarily an aversion to labels, but um, it's just words, but um, I would be like a humanist sort of yeah. teacher. Um, I observe, I facilitate if, yes, if we, st if we, our aim was to learn drums and now we're practicing piano. Maybe I might <laughs> divert you back to where you wanted to be. Yeah. Unless you tell me, you know what, I've moved on from drums, but that's fine. Maybe that example was not great. <laughs> My point well, is like... It is something because sometimes you, you find that you're uh, creating a space for people and people want to explore different areas or, you know, different yeah. things come up. So you might have thought, oh, I, I want to play the drums. But that's brought you to an interest in, you know, I might might use some like recording scenario or, you know, using a door or something like that with a student who wants to make some tracks or something and play along to them. Yeah. And then they, you know, that might send them off into a different direction. And, you know, I think it's good to have that freedom. Absolutely. And, and so that would be one element Then you also mentioned the way I was brought up as a drummer. So that brings... Um, to this chat like another sort of like motto that i have on, on I, I suppose like a little philosophical um statement that i try to go by which is never teach up yourself yeah you're right? not trying to create another you no for sure which is uh, it's done very frequently and I, and i empathize with teachers who do that because a it's a subconscious uh reaction you know like you you know what you know, you don't know what you don't know. Let me go with what I know. And I know this works because here I am, right, doing the job. Yeah. So there's almost like a logical sequence there that I it makes perfect sense to me. Okay. So let's let's dig into some some the more specific sort of topics. Yes. And you may or may not you, you can pass, right? But there's no, certain, I won't. there's certain um like sort of very conventional or conservative ideas and uh, one funny thing is, if you say this idea is not the be-all and end-all, the reaction to that often seems to be in your saying that you hate that idea altogether. So, for yes. example, one of the most common things you'll see is somebody going online saying, I've just got a drum kit um, and uh, I want to learn how to play the drums. What should I do? And then 20,000 people go, get a copy of Syncopation and Stick Control. And that's this gut reaction or not gut reaction knee jerk reaction and it's like yeah you might want a copy of syncopation and stick control you might not want it now you might want it now you might want it another point you might never use it at all um you know there's this very uh i don't know just a fixed idea so okay thing number one let's let's create a sensation does everybody need to get a copy of stick control and syncopation no <gasps> 
uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was I hesitated not because I didn't know the answer, but I was thinking, how do I say this without sounding condescending? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's tricky, isn't it? That's the thing. People always take these things the, the wrong way. I'm 100% in agreement. So let's let's hear your your rationalization. I mean, um, from my perspective, so if I'm teaching a complete beginner, I I I, I <laughs> I'm trying to think to myself now. At what point do I actually recommend a book? And it's not it's not the book. I don't even have a specific list. Um, I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, I'm trying to think of like my most recent big hit. Um, I recommended a book that I have recommended to many students, which is called The Complete Funk Drumming Book. Shout out to Mr. Jim Payne, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote a very um, nice book. I mean, it's not it's a groundbreaking really cool. book, right? But it's well organized. It starts with super basic for uh, like two limb coordination, three limb coordination. For, but I honestly, uh, Joe, I don't use it as a syllabus. Yeah. You're like, okay, page 22. Yeah. Like from the day they bought the book or they got yeah. the book. Page 22, because um, it's got a, some cool drum beats using snare drum off beats. Boom. Um, and then, you know, it might be another two years until I say, you know what book we should get? New Breed. It's a great book. Because then I introduced them to the concept of you know, you got the melodies and you can play over oscillators or this and that. Stick Control, I have recommended it to some students. But it's funny because I actually, and it sounds like maybe counter my own upbringing, but I teach the first three basic rudiments, singles, doubles and paradiddles, maybe like lesson three, four. Yeah, you, you've come to uh, the, yeah the next controversial question is uh, well. Let's generally say, do you have to learn the rudiments to be a drummer? Because that's the other sort of stuff. Uh, it depends on okay. That I suppose that depends on we're going to get into the maybe's questions, right? Because it's like it's all, yeah, it depends on what we also call rudiments. Um, if if I'm if I'm just being purely and uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, I suppose like very logical and very just pragmatic. A rudiment is just a sticking, and um, the, then we've agreed on this taxonomy yeah, of can't names avoid and stuff. Some rudiments, isn't it? It's yeah, like I mean, one of my stuff. teachers, one of my, uh, no, he wasn't the first one, but one of my teachers once told me, "Look, there's two types of drummers: the ones who know their rudiments and use them, and the ones who don't know their rudiments and use them." No. Um, <laughs> you might as well be the type that knows them because yeah. you're going to have a bit of a head start. <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah, I completely understand what you're saying. Like, you can't avoid using singles. I mean, you pretty much can't avoid using doubles because if you're going to start to set up a fill with a little diddle with something, oh, well, that's a double. Yeah. Okay, uh, you might be able to avoid using flams, but probably shouldn't. If you want to be a rock drummer, come on. Yeah, get you, could, I mean, you, could, you could actually much easier avoid doubles than flams. I like, like, there are rocks, there's quite a lot of rock stuff where you, could, you wouldn't hear a double stroke. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I, I'm thinking to myself, like, even when you hear drummers, like, um, wing their ghost notes a little bit, and every now and then they buzz the stick on the snare, well, let's clean that up. That's a double, but let's yeah. clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, I mean, it really becomes a, a, a game of, okay, I know I'm going to have to use these because of, if you keep pushing yourself in the game of drumming, yes, you're going to find that song by Nirvana that has the big flam fill. And yeah. then you're going to find like a funk little drum beat, like that's got a little bit of a buzz ghost, the buzz, buzzed ghost note. So maybe let's talk about drags. What's, what's the deal with this? I'm a little bit of, a, so again, going back to my approach, I teach widely. So if you come at me with an example, oh, I'd like to learn this song, my brain goes, yeah, let's take this apart. Yeah, yeah, and you sort of create the the curriculum around yeah. the the music people are interested in. Yeah, and and then and then we go wide with it. So let's take this apart, and I'm going to look. Okay, for this song, you need uh, this skill and that skill and the other skill. Let's put this on a list. And I I am quite um, you know, but the best system is no system. But then, as I'm in the teaching process, I'm actually quite organized. 
Because you, I mean, I, I assume that from your learning process, you would have a, a good sense of like the systematic formalities of of music teaching and and drum teaching. I'm, I've I've attained a lot from all my experiences uh, as a student, and yeah. so even with a very wide open system of teaching, where you know you bring what you're interested in, then mm -hmm. I will take that and turn that into a page of different exercises, develop vocabulary, and so on. I'm That's assuming. I, I think I'm getting the sense that we're we would probably recognize each other's teaching style. Yeah, but that's exactly right. That's what, what you just said. Like you come at me with a specific, I'm going to turn it into a concept. Mm -hmm. We're going to go up and wide. And I always say that I'm very open. There's no trick. There's no sleight of hand. I'm not trying to trick you into learning things I want you to learn. <laughs> this is what it is, right? You, that's you... a very commonly accepted notion, Joao. That yes. The teacher, and a lot of people talk positively, oh, my teacher, he tricked me into to learning. Yeah. And I always think, well, no, it's fine. If if you want to do this, do it. If you don't, then that's that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very open. I'm I, I'm always like, okay. So here's the. I in fact like depending on the age of the student I'm dealing with, but I'm thinking of a, a student that uh, I taught yesterday. He's an older student, um, and he's is he started late. So he's trying. And you mentioned adult students earlier, and he's trying to. He's, he's at this stage in his mind where he, there's a bit of a tug of war there between where he thinks he should be and the way I put it, and sometimes I can be a little um, direct with yep. the way I say things, where he deserves to be. Yeah. And, uh, and I've, I've said this to him and I said, how many years have we put into this? And he looks at me like he, he gives me that sigh like, yeah, I know. No, no, no. No, no, give me an answer. How many years? I don't know, two weeks? Exactly. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Like this applies to everything in life, right? You, you want to build, you want to go to the gym and be a super jacked sort of person? That's going to be 10 years of your life. You want to be uh, a painter? That's going to be 10 years of your life. You want to be a drummer? That's going to be 10 well, years of your life. Yeah, that sort of brings also this idea of uh sort of how you i guess how you sort of help students develop their aspirations as well i'm i'm becoming increasingly skeptical or, or there seems to be this sort of drive to get everybody to focus on you know being the best and being virtuosic and all of that yeah. and i think that that sometimes that takes away from also thinking oh well this is just something i can enjoy doing and there's certain degrees you know there's a the whole thing about drumming being sort of easy to get going i guess so and which can sometimes be a little bit challenging in the teaching scenario because somebody can play eye of the tiger quite quickly and then it's like a little bit difficult to get them to understand that okay there's a there's a certain amount of struggle involved as well in the process but um you you can get people going and i think that you can become like a really good rock drummer for example with a certain skill set and and a sense of being able to develop like to fine tune your sound in other words you could yeah. you could get to sound really really good so that you can go down to your local pub or if you're a kid you know you can join a local band and you can play really well and you don't have to then think oh how am i going to become tony williams right which yeah, you yeah. know i love people who want to become tony williams but it's not it's not required um yeah how how do we manage sort of people's expectations of that because i find people get into a sort of guilty thing oh i haven't practiced eight hours today and so yeah, it's it's how do we manage people's expectations or not manage them, but how do we encourage people in the right way, I guess? Is there too much focus on wanting to become virtuosic? That's my question. Um well, I don't I see exactly what you mean, but it it shows up to me in a different form. Um so the scenario that I encounter the most is actually associated with grades. Mm-hmm. Oh. There's the, this expectation around why isn't my kid doing grade eight? Well, because he started last week. Mm -hmm. First of all, like this is, I'm already very concerned about this. And we've turned some people down, like parents, right? Mm -hmm. Cause I don't like the idea that I'm turning the student down, but I have to put them all in the same agglomerate. And I say, this, you're, you're not going to like the way we run things. Yeah. <laughs> so let me put, let me be your friend, save your money. And find someone who's super keen on doing all the grades yeah. from day one. Um, so 
that so that's that's an issue with expectations because I mean, and of course I've had the question as I'm sure you have of like how long does it take to finish it? Yeah, which is always so such it's a funny question and and, and I have such a hard time answering it seriously. The, the end of which you're almost guaranteeing the person's not going to touch a drum after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the concept itself is just so strange. They don't have grades anywhere else, do they? I mean, okay, this is the thing, because this is a dangerous area for me. Uh, and recently, I did have a conversation with someone at one of the boards about this very topic. Yeah. And it's a bit dangerous, because something that, that I worry about, if I say exactly what I think, then it might come across as maybe being uncharitable towards the people who enjoy going through the process because i have some students who really it's they want to go through that process and i recognize that if that's what you want to do i'm cool with it but yeah. ooh, there's a topic and, and basically yeah oh ah there's no point to it it has no purpose i've done quite a lot of research and there isn't actually any purpose to it so parents want their children to do grades but it doesn't serve any purpose whatsoever i can't find it can't find the purpose of grades have you ever looked into this I could get into very ranty about this now. It's not no, let, let, yeah, let's do it. Uh, of course. I mean, I think you, you recently saw my exchange uh, about this on, yeah, on the Facebook group. That's why I thought it'd be good to talk to you. About, yeah, I know. I mean, it, it is, again, because it goes against, look, uh, fundamentally, this is a, a, an issue of congruency. For me, if I defend and I do a growth mindset, mm -hmm. if I defend uh, then an approach to assessment that it's based on, on progress rather than, you know, your, your best two hours of, of, of that day, like if you're lucky. Um, and if I defend uh, more of a, which is another element of my teaching approach, like a Socratic approach, which is inquisitive, not um, what's the, the, the opposite, not statement based. <laughs> yeah, not dictatorial um, or. Yes. Um, that's not the best word, but yeah. But, but yes, right. There, there's um, uh, there's a, a Latin uh, saying that um, su summarizes that, which is "Magister dixit," like the master said it. Yeah, and you must follow it. And Socrates was very much against that statement, which is yeah. why when the master says it, you should do the different thing. You should do it right. <laughs> and back then, even back then, <laughs> they they realized that. Uh, um, children and people were not um just these empty um what do you call them like vases or or, or just depositories of whatever knowledge the master carries and bestows upon you so kindly mm -hmm. uh, and instead these were peers and 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 books full of pages yet to be written on and but we're just books nonetheless just like yeah. you and you've just had more time to write more pages yeah. um and it's just a, an issue of hey i've been here for a little longer and, and sometimes they hear it's interesting because i'm obviously not like an old sage and i teach students who are older than me yeah and i remind them yes but the time that i've spent behind this instrument yeah it's <laughs> that's, that's the, the thing difference. that matters isn't it so um with um like the, the arguments about sort of this this curriculum. Oh, it's not even a curriculum. That's the thing. But this graded process. Yeah. Um, is there? Do you have any? Again, bearing in mind, I think we both sort of are equally uncomfortable, shall we say, with the thing. Yeah, I'll I'll go are, for are it. There any, get... Are there any? What are the positives in, yeah. in pursuing that? Uh, I'll, I'll go for it, and and you can blink for. I agree. Blink once. For, <laughs> blink twice for. Stop talking. Um, no, but uh, what are the positives? Yeah, okay. Let's uh, let's um, let's try to defend the case, right? For arguments, um, for 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 grades, I should say. The positives would be on a very practical level. Um, yes, if if you want to pursue music, let's say at a GCSE level or A levels or whatever. It will give you those that extra little boost in UCAS points in a field that you're already comfortable with. Have you ever looked into whether those UCAS points actually get you anywhere in life? They don't, but you know, if if we look at the way the system is designed, 
But that, that's what I mean. Yeah, it, the system I, doesn't care about UCAS points. That's the thing. I haven't found any evidence of a university that will listen to that as a as an option. Okay, but I, I mean, I'd like someone to prove me wrong. I'll speak for myself. Yeah. I applied for, so the, my educational psychology degree was in the UK. Mm -hmm. My music degree was in Portugal, but the second one was here already. Uh, do you know how many UCAS points I had to present? No. It was zero. Yeah. Because I, I didn't study that. here. I didn't yeah. even study here. And, yeah. and all they did was, yeah, that. okay, send us your, you know, high school diploma. And we'll just, I guess we'll look at it. No one's asked for, for a translation. <laughs> yeah. Like it was in Portuguese. No one's asked me like, oh, you'll have to certify a Nope. They said, come on in and do your yeah. best. Yeah. And that's what I, I did. What I, I, I done. phoned, I phoned universities and asked them whether if you have like a musical uh, grading background, do, do these UCAS points actually help in admissions? And no one said yes to me. It doesn't help in the musical studies here. They're not interested. Uh, it doesn't. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. So sorry, that was one of your positives. <laughs> but like, what about the internal process of the student? Is there something? Yeah. Okay. So from a less practical standpoint, less logistical, I suppose, and more human. Um, for some students, it gives them obviously a sense of accomplishment mm -hmm. when they receive that diploma. And by the way, I share that accomplishment with them. When I'm teaching a student and they get, they go in for their grade six, which is you know, uh, so I guess a little bit of a higher level. So they, they are practicing hard. It's not just, it's not a grade you can wing anymore. Yep. Uh, and they come back with the lovely distinction in their hands. I'm like, right on, dude, give me a fist bump. Okay. Now let's uh, park yes. these and let's work on drumming. Yep. Um, that's always my agreement with them, by the way. I have this agreement that it's very open. You want to do grades? I, look, I, I always ask why. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, if they tell me I've got one student who's done a bet with himself that he wants to have grade eight in three instruments by age 40. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? That's funny as hell. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, why would yeah, anyone yeah. want to do that? <laughs> yeah. But I, if, if it's coming from the student, the student wants to do it, then that, that's fine with me. Yeah. And, and his reasoning was so funny because he's like a 38 year old guy who's uh, creating this crazy expectation. And by the way, he might just pull it off. He, he's doing great at in drums now. So I'm like, okay. Um, and obviously, I'm okay with, with supporting students in, in achieving those things. Again, as long as the why aligns with what I do as well, because, you know, why would I do something or, or, or teach in a way that's just against my natural grain? I've learned to not to do that. It just upsets me. I don't want to do that. I want to have fun. Yeah. Uh, and um, but but then once it's accomplished, we have this agreement that okay, for the next six months, we're not talking about the next grade. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's yeah. That's, we're just going to learn drumming. Approach. Yeah, we're just going to go wide, and you're going to make me happy again. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, I guess my list of positives. Uh, pretty much ends there in terms of if we are to then flip the coin and, and make an argument against is that it a dilutes uh, th this list is going to come out so much faster dilutes learning to a very sort of confined framework here's mm -hmm. the song you have to learn hit yep. them notes and hit them in time and uh, if it says p to f Okay, go soft to loud, <laughs> and uh, and it's very like that, right? Let let's hit the marks. Um, drawing by numbers, it feels to me always. Mm -hmm. um, so it dilutes teaching from that perspective because it becomes very much learning by rote. Um, but, but also, it, it's deceiving to the actual student as to what their actual level is because I've seen people play grade six material; their sound is horrible. Like they can't produce sound to save their lives. And I'm like, wait, what? Especially like, as you've mentioned earlier, like you get students from other teachers because they're too busy gigging or what have you. Mm -hmm. You ask them to play a little bit. And the first thing they tell you like, oh yeah, with the, uh, with the, uh, I was going to say Joe over there, but that's not you. So to not make it, uh, Frank. Brian over there, <laughs> who, who was that? Oh, I don't know, whatever, Frank. Frank, Frank over there. 
uh, I've been working on my grade five rock school material. I'm like, oh, that that's cool. Play a little bit. And then you've seen it. I've seen it. It's like, what is this? You Timing is all over the place. That. Yeah. What do you Timing do? is. Yeah, exactly. And they, even they start playing, but it's like they have no authority in their sound. So for me, if you're telling me grade five, okay, that's one grade above mid level. Mm -hmm. You should sound one grade above mid, <laughs> mid level. Yeah, you should be able to just play a song. I mean, I, I think one of the things about the whole uh, thing is it's like trying to force this like uh, European dead white guys in wigs mentality onto an instrument that's improvisational, that's about you know learning by ear a lot of the time um but yeah it's it's yeah i could so go into the like a i could really get into like we could have like a three-hour conversation about it and, and sometimes i wonder if there's any point actually i know what you mean yeah I, i've refrained uh, yeah yeah i, I, I know react to those things i don't I, I don't know if you know if you look through my channel and uh i uh, my first like conversational video was with a guy and we decided to discuss a certain well-known drummer that everybody worships and that i was sort of i have a bit of an issue with just saying look there's no gods really and i've got nothing against anybody in particular but you know and so there's a part of wanting to sort of butt up against some of these conventional things and then there's another part um of then thinking actually why why focus on that but i know yeah, it's, it's a funny business because the because people seem attached to it. i mean uh, i had a conversation with someone within that institutional framework mm -hmm. and i pursued quite vigorously the question of what do you believe is the benefit of doing this and the only concrete thing that they said to me was that it gives teachers who don't really know what they're doing a pathway right that's what that's sad because I challenged them to show me some information that they had about it, providing educational benefits and so on and so forth within the institutional settings and so on. Does it help people actually, because they advertise, it helps UCAS points and all of this. So parents yeah. come and they say, oh, UCAS points. And so that's why I phoned around because I want to say to people, and I do say to people, look, make, do your own research because I might just be barking up the wrong various trees. So do your own research. But no one's ever come back to me and said, aha, I spoke to the university of so-and-so, and they said, in order for my child to become a dentist, they need to be really good at the drums. Or no, no one's ever, anyway. So yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I feel like we could have a rant, right? <laughs> About things and, and maybe maybe there's a thing. Yeah, what I'm thinking <laughs> is we've had quite a nice little chat for about an hour. Yes. And um, I, I don't know if maybe it, it might be interesting to sort of um, go away and have a, you know have a, some other chats maybe thinking about some topics that we might find interesting that we could both stuck in get stuck into i think some myth busting in terms of uh you're you're talking um carol dweck right with mm -hmm. um, the growth mindset yep uh i've you know there's peak there's all this there's quite quite a lot of sort of uh you know sort of educational stuff all about how you can uh, learn and that the, the are sort of uh, pushing up against conventional uh, things that a lot of people believe. And I, I'm, I'm what I suppose I think is that there's a lot of people who are so held back from pursuing their interest in uh, learning an instrument, whether it's drums or something else, or learning anything, because they believe all this crazy ideas that they got from going to school, which is you have to sit quietly and do what you're told and the teacher tells you this, and then you have to do an exam or some sort, otherwise you don't know what you're doing. Yes. Maybe there's uh, some sort of interesting way we could have a conversation like that. That would Because I feel like I want to help, like, all those people who are sort of watching, I was going to say Drumeo videos, but you're you're related to them. No, so no, I'm not. All right. Okay. So, so, but people are watching these online courses. Um yeah anyway i feel like there's things that we could say that would help people feel more positive about their ability to learn um there's a topic of self-teaching i'm just thinking actually a million topics that i can yeah. get into yeah well i mean the, the, i can if we want to kind of like set up a little cliffhanger for future yeah. conversations i'll say my belief on um I suppose I, I try to be as nuanced as I can, and so, so I myself don't fall into my own biases and, and my own mental traps. Um, but I do believe that 
everyone's potential is much i'm not going to say unlimited but it's much farther away that that ceiling is much higher than what they think it is everybody has a lot more potential than they believe they have 100 percent. yes i i and, and that's something that it, that's the the navigation process with them like you asked me earlier like how do you manage their expectations and aspirations right because it can go both ways their expectations might be too low my they they or, or too high they can mm -hmm. walk in there and be like i see i you know how many times have you heard this one on on a first lesson especially adults children don't really say this but adults like oh i bet you've never taught someone uh, anyone as bad as i'll be <laughs> every student yeah every adult. and i'm like <laughs> my dude okay lesson number one don't speak about yourself like that yeah i immediately go into my psychologist mode and be like nope okay let's make a deal you want to work with me you're going to be kind. Don't diss yourself. You're going to be kind to yourself. Whenever the struggle's on, you're going to remind yourself, I've struggled before. And, uh, and then when I persisted and I seek, you know, seek help and, uh, and that's, hey, that's me. I'm here. You can ask questions. I always remind them that you don't have to do this battle alone. Yep. Um, and, um, but in the, by the way, picking up on the topic of self-teaching, I do tell them, if you turn those um, rhetorical questions we ask ourselves like why can't i do this and you change the intonation to why can't i do this yet and start and then start answering it <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah. actually grab a pen and a piece of paper and write it down i'm not using metronome i'm not counting out loud <laughs> let's do those things instead okay so with a view to not taking up too much more of your time today yes if we if we maybe maybe we could uh, come back and have another conversation and see sort of see this a little bit of an introduction of getting to know each other a little bit sure and maybe think about um because i'm interested and, and again there's this slightly conflicting thing of like um i'm very interested in the self-teaching and what the boundaries are and the thing of talking about self-teaching as someone who's making my money teaching people but i think there is there's a there's a lot of things that we could maybe discuss that would be helpful to people but might incorporate a combination of doing it yourself and then maybe being able to interact with someone who's got a bit of experience because i don't think anyone's really self-taught you know charlie yes Parker i agree so i've watched other people playing the saxophone uh quite a lot so when they talk about someone self-taught you know that's complex but so how about we uh get together again and have a chat about the self-teaching thing and maybe also this idea of you know potential and understanding that yeah, these there's no. I think we're we're in agreement. There isn't a sort of fixed thing. You're not like either. I haven't got a sense of rhythm. All of that is just ludicrous. Yep. So so yeah, and because I'd I'd really like to provide some sort of insight from just point of view of just normal everyday experience. I'm not a scholar or an academic, but I've developed a. I've I've read the work of scholars and academics and developed a sense of everybody can do a lot more than they think they can. Mm. Um yeah so yeah let's do that joao let's do it I i'm up for it practice getting the name right because is it is joao joe or john or something in it's in john English? yes it's john okay cool yes. um all right so yeah let's uh, we'll wrap it up here what, what i'll do is i'm going to um provide a link in the description to uh joao's music school so you can there's a little bit of uh information about him there that if you want to learn a little bit more and then the cliffhanger will be we will do this again and and the cliffhanger will be yeah we'll do this again and uh, I'll, okay i'll i'll leave you with a sound bite right our job as teachers is not always necessary to provide solutions but new problems you didn't think of beautiful i love it great place to sign off Thank you very much for watching. Thank I hope you. you found something useful. Thank you very much for talking to me. And uh, let's see what sort of feedback we get from this conversation. And um, we'll sort of take it from there. And I really appreciate an opportunity to speak to you again. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Okay. Cool. Take care, Joe. Thank you.